And we are live. We are live with Brother Neil Frazier once again. I'm not going to talk too much. I just want to just announce the title of the show, The Psychosocial Pathology of Crimogenic Society. And I'm going to open up this screen to bring Brother Neil in because I've been waiting too long for this show. <laughs> yeah. I've been waiting too long. Greetings, there you go. Man. It's a beautiful sight over there, brother. Yeah, you know, this is one of my favorite parts. Like uh, when the springtime hit, then I'm, I'm out in the park. Because, you know, in the wintertime, you're, you're inside, you know, doing shows or doing whatever. But I love yes. this time of year, man. I, you know, I like to get out in the parks and stay active and do, do some things, you know. I'm yes. not living in the clouds, though. <laughs> that must be a hell of an experience. Yeah, I got to admit it is. It really is nice. I can't lie. But um, the main thing is that we are all mentally in the clouds as far as our ascension on, on a level of consciousness. And I hate to use ah, the word consciousness yeah. too much because people have diluted it, but we're all connected. And every experience that I have, eventually I know you will have if you haven't had it and vice versa because we bring each other up on so many levels when we communicate and share on a Monday evening or for you afternoon, mm -hmm. you know? So mm -hmm. we're all connected. It's a quantum thing. So when it, look, if you feel pain, we're all supposed to feel pain if we're in touch. If I feel bliss, we're all supposed to feel it. Some way, somehow, it may not be at the exact moment, but it's a collective thing. And so this is but why... You know what? You know what the issue is with that, brother, is, and, and you're right, I agree with you, is that we've been taught to, uh, for lack of a better word, fake it, like to, uh, to pretend so we can't be authentic with each other because yeah. of that. And that yes. takes a, a lot of our energy away. It does. It's almost when you think about those who are fans of the original Star Trek and they had Scotty that would say, Captain, oh, yeah. the dilithium crystals can't hold up. See, the force field that you put up, it takes a lot of your energy. You see what I mean? Yeah. Like, like, like yeah. this, this false thing. Of course, we have to protect ourselves. But, you know, if we can be real with each other and strip away the facade, strip away these idiosyncrasies and strip away what the world told us we need to be. And I'm not saying just expose our frailties with everybody. But, right, but right. I know understand that we all need help. We all need improvement. Absolutely. And once we come to that place, we can we can come up for real, for real, instead of Absolutely. faking it until we make it. Because a lot of us don't even make it because yeah. we're focused on looking like the real thing as opposed to being the real thing. Let me just say, uh, welcome to Virgo Venom, Renee Green, and Escape from Alcatraz. I see you here. Brother Neil is going to drop it on us today once again, and it's going to be another very edifying fellowship. Absolutely. Absolutely, Brother Lance. Well, I just want to greet you again, as always, on Mondays. You know, it's great to get with you. I want to greet uh, everyone in the chat room. And uh, this subject today, you know, as always, there's something that happens during the week that kind of directs me towards where I'm supposed to go with our topic yes. this week. And uh, I, you know, sometimes I just look at certain things just to kind of get a, um, a glimpse into what's going on with that particular situation at the time. And also to be cognizant of the fact that we are at war. And so that means that <clears throat> all, all of the constituents in the United States of America are compromised by criminality, criminology. And the term crimogenic actually means the source or the origin of crime and which we'll discuss today. So, um, a lot, of, a lot of the reasons why now we have to stare the beast in the face 
that we can't look away from it anymore. It's because the attacks, like I said, when I look on YouTube and other places, what they're effective doing is they are now transferring this energy of evil onto mainly our young people. And, and they're constantly showing these shows, okay, that um, is actually um, putting the onus on, on our young people as being violent criminals who now let me let me pause for a second before i get in the title i just wanted to kind of set the stage a little bit for you guys is that uh we're going to cover a lot today from a psychosocial perspective and and the reason why we're going to do that is because now they are starting to use words that they know actually is appropriate for our situation in order to kind of stifle us. So we don't like to use the word victim or even to even make it seem like or sound like we're using some type of victim card. But the fact of the matter is that that is a bunch of uh, sorcery or double speak because you can't change uh, what is your reality and the reality for black folks as we're going to see today is something that you cannot uh, run and hide from even though all of these attacks are coming at us constantly so today uh, the topic the psychosocial pathology of a uh, crime of Jenny society is very important we're going to cover uh, seven areas uh, we're going to talk about the hypocrisy of criminals who created a criminal society and then labels its constituents as animals and uh, violent people. When we know the type of violence that, that you're still engaging in, such as the trafficking of children worldwide, is still ongoing. Um, one of the things that uh, I looked at preparing this was I looked at this uh, worldwide organization that traffics in children. It's a it's a cult, um, and we we have to. We, the reason why I said we have to look the beast in the face now is because evil is almost daring you to say something or or, or to do something. It's it's right in your face. They're not even trying to hide it anymore. So we have to address it so we can be aware, not woke. Okay. Um, the other thing we're going to look at is who are the real criminals and what do they do? Where do they reside? Um, again, we're going to go to um, their statistics in order to answer these questions. Um <clears throat> we're going to look at the fact that there are, are two sets of laws, separate and unequal, and a system of injustice based on racial profile. We're going to look at a power structure that is designed for you to fail, mainly by using the media to weaponize it against you. So... One of the things, as I was saying, that they are effectively doing on YouTube now is the assassination of black people's character, mainly our young people, and their image. Well, we're going to challenge that today and show uh, what the origin of that is and how now, by you trying to project your criminality onto us, it's really going to show your true nature. Um, the, the last couple of things we're going to discuss is uh, the importing of drugs, guns, and crime into the black community as a source of uh, economics. So we know, that, as always, there's always been a war on black youth. Um, uh, one of the things that they effectively do is they make the fast money or fast food type mentality 
is something that they indoctrinate in our youth. So this has this has really worked against us in a lot of ways we'll discuss as well. Um, and finally, the economic assault on black people and the creation uh, of the new plantation. And, and uh, one of the things about that is when you, I, I did another in-depth study at different projects in major cities all around the country in every region of the country. It took a little while, but it was important. And it, it's really astonishing the game plan that they use, okay? And they use it, regardless to uh, what region or country we are in, they use the same playbook. They take our kids that are from, that come from um, abject poverty in most cases. There's some type of deprivation going on. And then they give them uh, a false sense of success based on the amount of fiat they can, regardless of how they can get it. And in most cases, that means going to war with your own community. And uh, it, it was amazing to me, I began to look at all the different regions of the country that this primarily, and then you have the puppeteers that are sitting at the top who are taking, uh, you know, all of the, using all of the uh, the negative things in the environment that our children live in, okay, and using that to handcuff them and cause them to fight against each other more. So let's talk about, uh, I think I came out on the lunchtime of uh, some of the people that work over here. Uh, what I'm going to do, Brother Lance, I'm going to move kind of far back. So um, uh, the noise won't uh, be on the video. Yeah, no, I understand. I hear yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, they're, Don't they're, worry about they're, it. You know, they're on their lunch break, you know, doing their I know. I hear them back uh, there. Yeah, yeah. I hear them back there. And it's uh, like they see you on the phone, and it's almost like they're going to project even more. See, that's one of the things, too. So respectful with each other. Yes. This uh, psychosocial pathology that that we're living in, and uh, there there is no. There's only you know, it's about me. If it affects you, then guess what? That's just too bad, and that's a sad state of affairs we're in, but. Be that as it may, talk about, uh, I'm going to break down psychosocial pathology, um, comprehension about us and understanding that we're here. Um, psychology is the study of the uh, causes, components, course, and consequences of psychological disorders. Uh, these are characterized by abnormality and dysfunction. Uh, social pathology is the behaviors that violate social norms and to the study of the causes of these behaviors. Basically, deviant social behaviors, including violence, abuse, and murder. This is very important term of uh, pathology. Let's look at the uh, aspect of the society we live in as it pertains to black people. Look at terms like violence, rape, abuse, and murder. You have to look at the crime, okay, because Nowhere in the of the world to the type of violence, the type of rape, the type of abuse, murder that black people in America have been subject to. So now, when you go on the media and you take 
of our young people, because the majority of them, because it's in us. Um, this is the way that um, generally black people have raised their children to be respected. Just like the situation here, this is, this is one of our great strengths that we have learned, and it has been to our detriment because everybody wants to show how, you know, disrespectful can be to another person, which is the lowest form that you as a human being can be at. As you say in your scriptures, how can you, uh, how can you respect or love your God and even do that with your brothers and sisters see every day. So when, when we look at the that we have a group of people can't come to grips with their own criminality that, that was basically designed to hold black people, but it has backfired because now you have all of these different types of uh, negative situations happening in our society, just basically the manifest of the seeds that you have planted. But a lot of what I looked at this weekend, looking at you know, the different projects, it didn't even have to be projects, it could be an area where you have over 40% of black people, then, then you see the same type of things when you're talking about, when you're looking at the study of the causes and components and consequences of these psychological disorders that develop in the environment where black people live, then you get, you get a better picture of how this is deliberately done. It's almost like the picture of the rat that I like to show guy with the lab coat on, where if I'm controlling everything in your environment, I already have a, a God complex, and then you go in the narcissism for black people, then you have all of these things happening at one time of this evil onto our young people. Now, to be fair, uh, we have a disproportionate amount when you look at the percentage that we are of, of, of the populace of the United States in certain areas of crime, okay? So, so it's, there's uh, a higher or disproportionate amount of our young people that are committing certain crimes but then these crimes come as a direct uh, result of the social content or the social context in which they find themselves. And, and that's gonna be very plain as, as we go along and take a look at this a little deeper. Now, let, let's talk about the word pathology. Um, pathology is a term used for deviance while psycho is used to indicate the mental or mind state, together, psychopathology is used deviance and mental state. Basically, uh, things like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and narcissism, all types of uh, psychopathology. But the most common mental health disorder in America is anxiety disorders. Uh, 40 million adults over the age of 18 suffer from this. And this is uh, an apprehension, uh, two of the biggest characteristics of this. Now, interestingly enough, this is because, again, uh, the system that has established this knows all of this. Okay. So. But this is why there's so much fear mongering amongst our people.
to keep you stressed out over fiat, to keep you stressed about the violence in our community, and just basically to keep you stressed out and in fear of things you have no control over. All right. So finally, we look at social pathology, which we're going to focus on more today. Uh, and at deviant behaviors that are caused by substance abuse, violence against women and children, which we mentioned earlier, uh, crime, and then terrorism, which, again, black people are the only people in this country that have suffered under actual domestic terrorism. Um, and then finally, there's the forced division of labor or excessive division of labor or the feudalism, feudalism system, which blacks are on the bottom. And see, this force uh, division of labor is very important because as we know, this is one of the reasons why we can't, in many cases, only because we will duplicate what they have. Who says that you have to have five million dollar uh, building in order to do business. See, these are the types of games that have always been played. So if I have the financial or economic um, ability to deny you the capital you need in order to make that happen, then I can effectively stifle any type of effort you make to come out of that because, again, now we're going to the psycho part or the mental state that we're in. And I, we always say that we have to go back to nature because as long as you're looking at artificial things that define success for you, for people that have 90% of your resources that were stolen, you're always going to be in the same position. Now, I want to talk about a few things before we go into the actual uh, text that's very, very important to the psychosocial pathology of a crimogenic society. Um, Lance, if you would put that picture up that I have of the 100 years of lynching there. Yes. Yeah. The first one. Yeah, the first one with the red has a, yes. Now, one of the reasons why I chose this picture and why this is very important, because as I said earlier, in order to project your evil and criminality onto us, then that means you have to hide or bury the evil and criminality that is the source of what you developed. So I want to say that again. When we don't talk about what you see on this screen, and when we don't remind ourselves of this, like all other people do, um, <laughs> I mean, there are certain people that never let what happened in their history die you know what I mean. So why, should, why is it every time bring this up, there is some type of uh, situation where people want to say that we're playing, no, this is not a victim card. This is actual history that is not in the history books, okay, that we know we have the receipts to prove that it happened. But you're talking about a hundred years of violence, of rape, of crime, and of murder that's documented by you. But yet, on the media, on YouTube, and all these other places where all of these stories, mainly from from uh, new genres mainly from the music industry that we know is corrupted by you. And then the entertainment world, where you have people who really 
are 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 acting um, in in accordance to the scripts that you write. Because if we had black people writing these scripts and movies that we see, it would be something totally different. It would be more true than the lies that have always been told. But here we have a hundred years of lynchings. Now, let's let's look at something today. This is what I mean about the psychosocial pathology of a crimogenic society. When you have a people that refuse to acknowledge this history, but yet at the same time you make a conscious effort. So let's go a little deeper into this. So really, when you start looking at the statistics, um, when crack really hit our communities in the '80s, right? And, and this started, I would say, almost close to like 80, well, 86 and 87 is when you start seeing the statistics for violence and robbery and carjacking and home invasion, the types of crimes where we see mainly what our, our people are doing, young people are doing. And again, not making any excuses, but if, if I, and, and they have done uh, uh, studies on this, where let's take the monkeys that they took away from their mothers when they were born and place them in any environment, that monkey is going to become whatever that environment it was taken to. The same thing they did with young children. When you, if you take them away from their mother at birth and you raise them in an environment that you control, I don't care uh, what their genetic uh, makeup is, they're going to become what was taught to them in that environment. Now, they, because of the connection that we have with nature, as they grow and experience more things and get experiential knowledge, they will start to connect with certain things. But again, we see that the society's ills are so strong and that young people have this in their mind because they parade this across every medium of media whenever they get a chance, that they're only successful if they have this fiat that's not any, not even worth this, that they're throwing around like it's some type of deity or something. So let's look at some his, historical acts of violent and crime, violence and crimes against humanity and against black people in particular in this country. Um, we're gonna look at five documented instances that's going to shed more light on what we're talking about in terms of the psychosocial pathology of a crimogenic society. Um, first, we're going to look at the Atlanta Race Massacre in 1906. Um, one, of the, one of the things that consistently happened is Black people begin to come out of, you know, being on plantations okay, for centuries. One of the things that happens is whenever they establish their own businesses, that there was this jealousy and enviousness that existed with the culture who already had everything. But just the fact, so this particular incident happened uh, based as always, on a lie that four white women were raped, the same playbook. They, they made it up. And then there were 25 blacks that they documented, we know it's much higher, uh, that were killed. And all the businesses that they had established were burned down. And see, again, it always goes back to that, burning down the homes, killing and lynching our people and also burning down the business. So if, if you are this great Christian society that you project to the world, but yet you want to project this criminality on our young people, 
let's look at your real history. Let's talk about your real history. Um, then uh, moving right along, another one that's well known is Rosewood, which was a thriving black community in Florida in 1923 on January uh, 4th. It was burned to the ground based on what? A lie of rape by a white woman. It lasted several days. They say 27 people were killed, but they found a mass grave with a whole bunch of black people in it that was uncounted. And then the most asinine thing is, and see, this shows your, your real colors, okay? This shows your real colors because you refuse to pay the descendants, okay, or compensate them for something that was evil, was wicked, okay, and something that you did that was really ungodly, if, if, if you want to look at it for what it really is. Um, the Springfield Race Massacre, 19 August 14th through 15th, a white mob did not want two black men to have a fair trial, like we said. And we're going to talk about, the last thing we're going to talk about is OJ real quickly before we go into the text, is that, imagine this, they did not want the uh, black men to have a fair trial, okay? So there were, they say, at least 2,000, uh, uh, a mob of 2,000 white, okay, that basically, uh, dragged them out of the uh out of the jail out of the courthouse okay okay they started killing black people and hanging them and burning down homes churches and businesses again you know but yet when we do this in these cities where something is unjust justly done to one of our people, like the Rodney King situation in recent memory, then we are looked at as, well, why are these people doing this and blah, blah, blah. When you have a history of this, we're talking hundreds of years here, okay? Uh, it's estimated that there was $150,000 worth of destruction in the black community eight dead, two lynched. We know it was much higher. Um, the last two we're gonna look at is the Slocum Massacre uh, in Texas, 1910. The KKK uh, wanted to take land from black farmers and uh, started killing the black farmers. So they made up a lot that blacks were playing at a riot. Again, these mobs showed up uh, many of them were shot down blood. They say between 40 and 200 black people were murdered. And last but not least, we're gonna look at the East St. Louis, Illinois massacre in 1917, where again, um, whites were jealous that these black people who had just come out of slavery, again, many of them could not read and write, although more of them began to read and write because it was not um, illegal for them to learn how to do it now. Well, actually, they, it was a death sentence at that time. Um, but still, okay, there were 150 people killed, 6,000 homes destroyed, $400,000 in property damage, and today, that would be, uh, I think I saw the figure is like $2.5 million. Um, they actually, the children that were trying to run out of the schools and out of the uh, home, they stood there with rifles and made them run back in the burning uh, uh, facilities. And the adult, adults were shot down. So, you know, that right there debunks. Um, this theory that you have created and what you're trying to show these people that you have to this country legally, how bad black people are, when this system has been designed and it's still designed 
okay, to actually project your criminality onto us. Now, I want to talk about the OJ case real quick before we go uh, into the main text. Uh, an interesting thing, I have a, okay, I love serial killers. I, I, let, me, let me say that, that doesn't sound right. I love to study the lives of serial killers. Forgive me for saying that. That was a, a Freudian slip. And I like to look Don't at- Don't worry about that, brother. Sorry to interrupt, but I have to admit that when I was growing up, I was a serial killer. Sugar Smacks, <laughs> Cheerios, you know, Wheaties. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's a good one. I love it. I love it. I love it. So, uh, the interesting thing about the OJ case, now, there, and, and see, this is something that's known by the authorities who was tracking this guy. So let, let me just get out. Simpson did not kill his ex-wife and Ron Goldman. A crazed serial killer named Rogers did. And, you, and now... I knew this years ago when I was following this. But now, now, now with new evidence, because they can't hide it any longer, um, because this guy who was a friend of O.J. Simpson, who was a, um, a businessman and an investigator, he just came out with this movie that deals with this. Of course, it's banned in America. Um, his name is Norman Pardo, and he says that O.J. Simpson did not kill Nicole Simpson. And in the movie, the women says that uh, Glenn Rogers was hanging out with Nicole and Faye Resnick, and that they tracked his movements all over the country. Now, this guy killed uh, 12 women that they know of. He, he admitted to saying he killed 70 women and one man that they know of. Okay, now there are a couple of interesting things about this. And the reason why I'm bringing this out is because it's interesting that they would allow a serial killer, okay, that's going all over the country killing innocent women that they knew was involved with this in order to nail one famous black man to the cross, okay? Uh, in fact, Glenn Rogers confessed to this, to his brother did a documentary, and it's interesting that they went all the way back to his childhood. I, I must admit, he had a, a horrible childhood, the things that he was exposed to, but nonetheless, Let's deal with the truth. Many of our people, um, in fact, when uh, Lonnie Franklin, who, who they call the, uh, the Grim, okay, uh, this black serial killer, they didn't say anything about his uh, upbringing or none of that. Okay, but um, his brother, um, confessed to it, did a, a long a documentary about it, had a lot of remorse, so he says, that had, you know, he was torn in the fact that this was his brother. He basically um, brought into his younger brother into a life of crime and who basically, uh, you know, had gone over the edge psychologically, okay? Um, so, like I said, the authorities knew that Glenn Rogers did this, that he was attached to this. The interesting thing is O.J. Simpson knew they were, to, in fact, they were together the night. So, so he was operating under another alias, okay? He worked at a local paint company. And all of the places where he murdered these women, he, he was a, a, what you call a, a, a psychopath and a sociopath because 
he knew how to entertain people. He knew how to charm women. And he knew how to get jobs. Okay. So he would work these jobs. And then he'd get to know, you know, a woman in that state. Because he went, I think it was five different states where he murdered. And then he, he, some of them he lived with. And he ended up killing all of them. Okay. Um, but the other thing, too, is that the investigators in several states, they, they knew this. Okay. They had his prints and they had the receipts. But again, you know, they wanted to nail O.J. Simpson because it's different when the lives of white people are taken at the hands of a black person. And they knew that this guy was a mass murderer. They knew that he had connections with Nicole and uh, what's his name, uh, Ron Goldman, and with Faye Resnick. And that there were drugs involved. And that's just, it's, it's just a whole, and these are things, like I said, I had been following for years. I knew some of this, but he really broke it out. Okay, um, the final thing is, uh, he bragged to his brother and his sister that uh, he, he even sent a picture of him in Nicole Brown Simpson to his sister. He said, you know, now this beautiful woman, she's rich. She's married to this black um, famous athlete. And uh, he said, I'm taking him down. Also, not only did he send a picture of him and Nicole to his sister, he sent, so they found this angel pen on Nicole Brown Simpson. Obviously, it was something that she liked. And uh, somehow he got possession of one of these pens. I think maybe she had two or three on. Sent it to his mother, and his mother wore the pen. Okay, his mother wore the pen at his trial. Okay, and, and these are these are facts that cannot be denied. Okay, so again, we're looking at a situation where we have a cryogenic society, okay, that's based on hypocrisy, based on the color of your skin. Um, now, let's let's get into something that's very important because we talked about. Lance, you could take that picture down. Um, one of the pictures that I want to put up when we go into this subject here, when we talk about who are the real criminals, uh, what do they do and where do they reside, um, we're talking about the hypocrisy that exists in our chromogenic crime, society. Okay? Now, if you, if you would put up that picture where you see uh, it's it's like a laundromat where the money is I mean a washing machine where they're cleaning the dirty money and it's going into it's it's like uh, three men standing around and it's like a laundry yes that's it that's it now money laundering which is considered a white collar crime. Okay, well, well, let me lay this out first. And, and these are statistics that they hide. Again, this uh, they're always um, parading. Anything that happens of a violent nature, um, they're always trying to project this characteristic on our young people. But many people don't know is that the uh, highest type of crimes committed in the United States is property crime, which includes laundering, which you're going, to, which you're looking at now. It's laundering, bribery, and fraud are the three biggest. Um, but who are the real criminals? The now, these statistics that I'm going to give you come from the U.S. Department of Justice, and this was. Uh, in May 20, on May 21st, 2022. Who are the real criminals? The majority of white collar crime offenders are whales. Specifically, around 80% of 
of white collar criminals are men. And 75% at this, three quarters of the white collar crimes that are committed in America of the offenders in white collar crimes are whites. U.S. Department of Justice, May 21st, 2022. Now, I want to read that again because a lot of times things go by our head and we don't get, like I like to say, the totality of it. Now, when the reason why I'm showing this visual is because, as I said earlier, um, you, you have to look at the types of crimes that are being committed based on the social context in which they reside. Okay, black people do not have access to this type of capital, or do they have access to any banks where they could perform this type of criminality? So you see, it's just a matter of uh, the what you have access to, okay, because as I said in the beginning, that uh, a crimogenic society criminalizes all of its constituents. It's just the type of crimes that they commit vary based on their, um, their social construct. So again, the majority of white collar crime offenders are white males. Uh, you know, people are always talking about women, but women don't commit these crimes, okay? And there are some of them that are involved in that, but it's like less than 7%. But specifically, the good male Christian people that our women hold our feet to the fire as standards, okay, 80% of white-collar criminals are men, and 75% of the offenders in white-collar crime are whites. So the reason why I'm pointing this out is because every time I turn on a YouTube channel and one of our sisters are talking, okay, they're using these, uh, the, the, individuals that I'm referring to as a standard that we should aspire to. It's always been that way. It continues to be that way. Okay. When I would say 80% 80, 80 of black men want or are trying to do the right thing. Okay. And even with the um, situations that we're put in, they are still trying to work what they can based on the hand that they're dealt. Even trying to recreate situations where they don't have to be subject to the types of, of uh, crimes that many of our men are pigeoned into. Now that's not to make an excuse for anyone I'm just pointing out the difference. Okay, as you can see on this picture, this is a major crime being committed and it goes on every day. But somehow this is looked at as okay. Okay, because, and, and as we get into the figures a little more, you're gonna see why. Now, white collar crimes make up only, get this, 3% of federal prosecutions yet Okay, it is the largest type of crime that happens in the United States. So what does that tell you? The majority of men that are incarcerated are black and brown men. But yet we know that the highest rate of property crimes based on uh, money laundering, uh, fraud and bribery, as we'll see going down, makes up the highest percentage in which we are not involved in, in the United States. But you don't see this on TV at all. Because even when I was talking about the fact that we have two sets of uh, justice systems, okay, 
uh, that uh, one is based on black and brown men and the other are based on white males. Clearly, 3% are, are ever prosecuted for the highest crimes in the country. D does that make sense? So now you begin to see the, uh, the social psychological pathology that exists in this crimogenic society. Okay, um, white collar crime refers to a range of fraud committed by business and government. Okay, and when you look at the reality of this is that the people that control the majority of corporations, all the corporations in our society and the majority of businesses and that run our government do not come out of communities. Now, yeah, there may be a few here and there, but I'm talking about the ones that make the real decisions. They don't come out of our communities. Okay. Very few of them uh, ever get prosecuted, as I mentioned before, 3%. Um, in fact, prosecutions decrease 53% for white collar crimes from 2011 to 2021. Um, the, the annual losses as of 2021 is between $426 billion to $1.7 trillion. Now, what a black folk. How is it? Okay, let me say this again. The annual losses, I'm talking about annual losses based on white collar crime as of 2021 is between $426 billion to $1.7 trillion. That, that says it all right there. But yet this is never talked about on television. We probably wouldn't have known anything about it if Bernie Madoff would have never got caught. Okay. Or Enron. Um, the reason for this is it is estimated, and this is unbelievable. Okay. This is unbelievable. It's 90% of white collar crimes go unreported. This is unbelievable. So, uh, if you would put that other picture up there, um, it's the one where the, the um, law enforcement is standing with a look like some type of banking official, um, or it could be a governmental official. Um, no, that's not it. And they're, yes, forcing this guy, okay, like they do every day, to do something that's illegal. But yet, he is powerless. If he said no, God knows what might happen to him, um, besides losing his job. So when we start the psychosocial pathology of a crimogenic society, we have to look at this. But yet, when you see these people in these suits and carrying these briefcases, you look at them as upstanding Christians. OK? And this is how our people have always been um, hoodwinked, okay? Now, again, 90% of this goes unreported. 50% of investors, okay, are managers, okay? And fraud is the most common form of white collar crime, 63%. Um, however, and this is unbelievable, the average printed prison sentence for white collar crimes, such as fraud, is only 27 months or two years and three months. When you have black men in prison that are doing five to 10 years for a bag of weed. So you see this, this 
this psychosocial pathology of this chromogenic society. And as I always like to see, say, an alien can see this. Stevie Wonder and Ray Charles can see this. There are two sets of injustice systems, okay? And clearly, this is not from Neil Frazier. This is from uh, the U.S. Department of Justice. Okay. Um, and then finally, certain demographics of white-collar criminals need a certain status or job type, which black people don't have or never get, and the ones that they do, um, you can't really say, like these coons, that they're black people. Because black is not really a color. And, and they also have to have the know-how to commit these crimes. So, how, you know, so that means that you have to be dealing with, with people that are teaching you how to commit these crimes. So we're talking about, first of all, immorality, or, or well, there's no such thing as American morality in America. Let's talk about unethical behavior. But you and I, okay, are held at a different standard. Um, that's, you can put that other picture there for me real quick as I go through this. Uh, let's see, whichever one you put. You there, Brother Lance? So in the U.S., less than 10% of female men, no matter what you say about women, they are not committing these types. They, you know, a lot of men might get mad at this. What it is, I don't bite my tongue over truth. Okay, you're talking about less than 7% of women that commit these kind of crimes. So basically, they, they have some sense of ethics where it's proven that these men do not. No matter what image they're projecting to you, they're projecting black men, deviant people. The, rec the numbers speak for themselves. Okay. So um, let's see here. And now, this is really, really astonishing. That's why I want you to put that other uh, picture up there, Lane, uh, because bribery is 84.9% of this type of crime. Now, yes, right there. Now, imagine that. So, this change is the legalese. You say, Okay, it's not a, uh, a fee, right? Who's going to challenge it? Something like that. And see how many charges you get. Okay? But 85%, 84.9% of this type of crime, bribery. Okay, and despite being 60.1% of the U.S. population, Okay, 85% of, these, of this bribery are committed by white males. Okay, 17% of embezzlement cases take place in the financial services industry, okay, which again, we're talking about None of the people from those major Wall Street banks, thousands of them, were ever convicted of, of all the money that stole, that caused that collapse that Obama bailed them out in 2000. None of them. I think maybe I heard two of them went, served like small, like less than two years or something. Okay but you have taken millions, in a lot of cases, billions, put it account or into your corporations. And see, this is, this is why we cannot, 
this narrative about painting our people as criminals. We cannot let this stand because this is just, yes, our kids are out here doing things. They're harming people. They're doing, they're harming each other mainly and killing each other. And I am not excusing that, but I am saying that the massive amount of crimes being committed in this society are not being committed by black men or women for that matter. The number one crime in America, again, okay, is property crime, which I just went over the statistics with you. But get this, there, there was over 6,000 I'm sorry, 6,513,800 29 property crimes in 2022. Now let me say that again. 6,513,829,000 property crimes committed in 2022 as opposed to 1,232,428 uh violent crimes committed okay so we're talking about a five to one situation yet and don't get me wrong violent crimes are you know they affect us in a way where it's right in our face from an emotional standpoint so but but we're not talking about almost seven million crimes committed in 2022. That should be something that should be headline news every day on all the major ne networks, CNN, Fox, I don't care what their politics are. So this shows a clear conspiracy to hide this type of criminal activity, let alone not being prosecuted for. Yet the media continues to promote black people as the biggest criminal threat in America. And finally, I want to give one last statistic according to the 2019 Uniform Crime Report of hate offenders identifiable by race, 61.5% white, 28% black, 22.3% Latino, 7.8% were groups of individuals of varying races. And with that, Brother Lance, I Clue. Okay, my brother. Thank you, man. You dropped a whole lot of information in a condensed form tonight. And I have to listen to this all over again, like I usually do to get it all. You know, Absolutely. I got to bring my doggy bag to the finish because you give us so much nutrition. I can't eat it all at one time. <laughs> Thank you so much, brother. Absolutely. And Thank um, you, brother, I'm looking man. forward to this week. Thank yes, you, and, we, we, and we, we definitely at some point continue to keep the let, of our people in the spotlight. Oh, you know, we're going to do that, man. That's that's my purpose. That's my purpose. That's and we're right. never going to stop. And thank you. And brother, at some point during the week, work you do. let me know when we can chop it up on a personal okay, level. I will. I'll let me know. Email, anyway. Okay, definitely. Thank you so much. All right. Okay, take care. All right. Much love to you, brother. Much love. Yes. Bro. All right. Okay. Peace. All right. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Thank you all for being here. Just want to say that I'm um, doing a whole lot of things, <laughs> a lot of projects, a lot of things. And maybe one day I'll do a Patreon live and show you face to face what I'm doing. And other than that, I'll just keep on dropping the good content. And I'm just glad to have a brother like Brother Neil on the board because he is real. He is about it. He's not going to bring you any lies. He's going to tell it like it is. So I'm going to wrap it down. I got a few things I want to work on. I know whether I, I may write a little bit tonight, you'll see it tomorrow. But I'll definitely come back with some more shows. It's been a real long day for me. I've been waking up 4 a.m. in the morning, dealing with the crew around 7, 730 and working all day here on the home front. And um, everything's coming along beautifully. I just want to thank you for the good feeling and the good energy. And it's just so many wonderful things coming before the year is out that would blow your mind that when I do reveal, 
it, it's it's a mind blower. So for every setback that we have, or what looks like to be a setback, it's a setup for something even bigger. And I I, I can't even believe it. All right, I'm gonna hype it up, and I'm not gonna forget. And toward the end of the year, say, Lance, tell us about this. I'm not gonna say, Oh no, we're all. Uh, -uh. I got the phone call, and it's a definite. So um, I'm really happy about that. So in the meantime, just keep on. Let's share the positive energy. Keep on forging forward, and there is no, you know, no, no hold back. Sometimes you get knocked down on one knee. You take the count. You come up and take that rest, and come on and keep on swinging. I'm built for this. You're built for this. And whatever destiny we have, we're going to fulfill it, and we're not ever going to stop. Just always remember that. Much love to you all. We're going to have something good live tomorrow, some good writing tonight before I doze off. Take care. Know that I always love you and carry you with me in my heart every single minute, every single day that I live. Peace. Make sure to go to landscurve.com, an online magazine established in 2001, containing written articles, thousands of talk shows and discussions, cutting edge cartoons, as well as erotic expressions and tasteful adult photography. It's definitely not for the faint of heart. Once you get a taste of the world of Landscurve, Trust me, you'll be back for more. LanceGurve.com Bold, raw, and uncut.